Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Donna Michi and Maureen O'Hara in Heaven Can Wait. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. For 20 years, our town has admired something called the Lubitsch Touch, that special brand of gaiety and romance that distinguishes pictures directed by Ernst Lubitsch. And tonight we offer a prize example of this cinema magic, the current screen hit from 20th Century Fox, Heaven Can Wait. Hard-boiled Hollywood thinks Don Amici gave his best performance in this picture, and tonight he plays the same part Opposite, Maureen O'Hara, one of Hollywood's most brilliant young actresses. Heaven Can Wait has no social problems to solve, no message, but the all-compelling one of good entertainment. And we never can get too much of that, particularly these days. The play is the story of a man named Henry Van Cleve, who's been in hot water most of his life because of his rather enthusiastic interest in the opposite sex. But uh, he's at least ca- at last called to account in a very strange play. I think Heaven Can Wait should go very well with this national audience and with our global audience, too. That's a fairly new addition consisting of those Americans in uniform all over the world who enjoy these plays along with us at home. It's really one gigantic family fireside that Lux Flakes brings together on these Monday evenings. Somewhere... On a little South Pacific island, a lad may be listening. While somewhere on the plains of Iowa, his family is listening too. Perhaps, in its way, the Lux Radio Theater has become a kind of American institution, just like the product that makes this theater possible. You may have to wait a few days now and then to get Lux Flakes, but it's worth waiting for. Now a hit play, as the curtain goes up on Heaven Can Wait. Starring Donna Michi as Henry Van Cleve and Maureen O'Hara as Martha. Henry Van Cleve passes on. Millionaire, 70 years old, succumbs quietly. When Henry Van Cleve died, he realized it was very unlikely that his next stop could be heaven. So with dignity and gentle humility, he presented himself at the place where people had so often told him to go, Hades. Now he stands in the outer office of the head man of the region, known to his devilish associates as His Excellency. At last, an attendant whispers in Henry's ear, and he's ushered into an elegantly furnished office, where, behind a huge desk, sits an elegantly dressed gentleman... His Excellency, the Devil. Ah, how do you do, Mr. Van Cleve? Come in, please. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. It's very kind of you to receive me. Not at all. Sit down. Thank you. I hope you'll forgive my keeping you waiting, but we're very busy, really. Sometimes it looks as if the whole world is coming down here. Frankly, I haven't had an opportunity to familiarize myself with your case. Uh, When did it happen, Mr. Van Cleve? Tuesday... To be exact, I died at 9.36 in the evening. I trust you didn't suffer much? Oh, no, no, not in the least. I had finished my dinner. A good one, I hope. Oh, excellent. I ate everything the doctor forbade. And then, well, to make a long story short, I fell asleep without realizing it. And when I woke up, all my relatives were there speaking in low tones, saying nothing but the kindest things about me. Then I knew I was dead. I hope your funeral was satisfactory. Well, there was a lot of crying, so I believe everybody had a good time. It would have been an ideal funeral if Mrs. Cooper Cooper, a coloratura, hadn't volunteered to sing The End of a Perfect Day. Mr. Van Cleve, I can see you have a sensitive, cultivated ear. Oh, thank you. And let me warn you, the music down here is anything but pleasant. Beethoven, Brahms, Mozart, you hear them only above. I know. It won't be easy never to hear the old masters again. And there are several people up there I would love to see, particularly one, a very dear one. 
But I haven't a chance. Have you tried? No, Your Excellency. I know the life I lived. I know where I belong. I'd like to get it over as quickly as possible. Very well. If you meet our requirements, we'll be only too glad to accommodate you. Would you be kind enough to mention, for instance, some outstanding crime you've committed? Crime? Crime? Well, I'm afraid I can't think of any, but I can safely say my whole life has been one continuous misdemeanor. Well, well, get on with it, but make it as brief as possible, please. Well, perhaps the best way to tell you the story of my life is to tell you about the women in my life. Ah, you begin to interest me. Well, let's start with the first woman, my mother. A lovely lady, but prejudiced. I was bald, and I looked like a boiled lobster, but she thought I was wonderful. She was the first woman I ever fooled. And then there was my grandmother. She was just as prejudiced as my mother. Oh, the little darling. Here, let me hold him a minute. Oh, please, Mother Van Cleve. Let the baby rest. Oh, you're just jealous, Bertha. Give him to me. I can't stand this any longer. I'm going to talk to Randolph about this. Yes, Randolph. First you take my son away, and now you want to alienate my grandchild. You see, I was only ten days old, and already women were fighting for me. What a way to start a man on the road of life. Hmm, go on. My next lesson came from Miss Chivers. Miss Chivers was my teacher. I was always late or absent, so one day I brought a note. My dear Miss Chivers, my dear little Henry was very sick, so please excuse and don't wallop him. Signed, Henry's father. Henry, did your father write this? Well? Well? Oh, I knew I wouldn't get away with it. Shall I get the ruler, Miss Chivers? Oh, no, never mind. But don't let it happen again, dear. Oh, thank you, Miss Chivers. That made me realize women love men who smile sweetly and say, I did it. Very true, very true. And then there was little Mary. She was nine, just my age. She was pushing a doll carriage along our street one day when... Hello, Mary. Don't you talk to me, Henny Van Cleef. You're a bad boy, and my mother says I shouldn't talk to bad boys. I bet you don't know what I have in this box. And I'm not interested, Henry Van Cleef. Then I won't tell you that it's a beetle. A beetle? See? You like it? Oh, who doesn't like beetles? It's yours. Oh, thank you, but I wonder if I should take it. Oh, don't worry. I have another one. Another beetle? Uh-huh. See? Oh, it's beautiful. But it looks rather lonely. I think it wants to be together with mine. You mean you want this one, too? Henry Van Cleve, you think I'm the kind of a girl who would take away a boy's last beetle? Oh, that's all right. You can have it. Oh, thank you, Henry. Now, if you want to, you can walk with me to the corner. From that moment on, one thing was clear to me. If you want to win a girl, you have to have lots of beetles. Oh, yes. Well... Then there was the matter of the French governess we had. I was 14 years old then. I borrowed my father's dress suit and $20, and we went to Delmonico's for dinner. You and the governess? Yes. You were 14 at the time? Yes. Think of that. Did you enjoy yourself? Oh, very much. Good. Up to a certain point, anyway. I drank too much champagne, and then my family found out about it. Oh, how? How? My cousin, Albert Van Cleve, told them. Hmm. Go on. Well, I suppose the first really important incident was the morning of my 26th birthday. That was back in 1899. There was a big family conference that morning. My mother, my father, and my grandfather. It was about me, of course. Oh, that boy, where is he? Why didn't he come home last night? Now, Bertha, I'd like to give you some consolation, but all I can say is, uh, chin up. Randolph, where does the boy get it from? Our own son. I give up, Bertha. I never gambled in my life, and I never knew what a musical comedy girl looked like. Why, to this day, I wouldn't know how to find the stage entrance to a theater. It's always around the back, Randolph. It has a sign over the door. You can't miss it. Father, <laughs> please. I'm not interested. <laughs> Too bad. Oh, where does the boy get it from? Father built up the Van Cleve Importing Company from nothing. When father stopped, I carried on. Dad, you must admit that from the day I left Harvard, I earned every dollar I ever spent. Then why do you give Henry money without making him work for it? Why, I, I, I had to save the family name. But what about you, handing him hundreds of dollars? 
If I had ever come to you for money, would you have given it to me? No. But you give it to him. Why? Because I like him. Father, does that mean by chance that you didn't like me? Son, I love you. Now shut up and leave me alone. Good morning, Grandfather. Good morning, Albert. Good morning, Uncle Randolph and Bertha. Good morning, Albert. Albert? Well, I just came in to bring a little birthday remembrance for Henry. Ah, anything wrong? Isn't he home? Well, it's 11 o'clock Sunday morning, and if I know my cousin Henry, he's probably still in church. I mean that humorously. <laughs> Albert, I'm struggling successfully against the gout, and I'm waging a terrific battle with my liver. But I doubt if I have the strength to survive your jokes. You're a successful lawyer. Let it go at that. I love you, Albert. I beg your pardon. Oh, Albert, it was sweet of you to drop in so early. I, I hope Henry will be here tonight to thank I you. I hope so, too. Otherwise, I'd be in the most embarrassing position so far as my future in-laws are concerned. Oh, we're so eager to meet your fiancé. How does she like New York? Well, she's only been here for two days, and naturally the impression is overwhelming. Uh, and her parents, Albert. How are they? Oh, yes. And how does the big butcher from the wide-open spaces like New York? Father, please. Grandfather, you don't seem to have any idea of the importance of Mr. Strabel. Why, he's one of the great meat packers of our time. He created the most famous character in American advertising, Mabel the Cow. Uh, you've seen her on billboards, Father. The big happy cow smiling at you over the fence and saying in big letters, uh, 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 how does it go? Uh, to the uh, world, my name is Mabel, which you'll find on every label. I am packed by E.F. Strabel for the pleasure of your table. No cow, no cow in its right mind could have said anything like that. Sounds more like Mr. Strabel. Grandfather, please. Oh, Mr. Van Cleve. Uh, yes, Flogdo? Mr. Henry has just come home. He went directly upstairs. Uh, thank you, Flogdo. Well, I'd been out all night. I was in my room just getting out of my evening cape when Mother came up to speak to me. Henry. Good morning, Mother. Are you all right, my boy? Yes, Mother. And many happy returns. I'm sorry, Mother, if I made you unhappy. Father and Grandfather and I... Well, we are worrying ourselves to death, but you don't give your family a single thought. All that matters to you is having what you call a good time. Mother, I went out last night to raise Cain. Oh, son, you mustn't talk like that. Don't worry, Mother, I didn't. I couldn't. I couldn't get her out of my mind. Henry, you bewilder me. Are you well? Mother, when you saw Father for the first time, did you feel that unmistakable something? Did you feel an electric spark from your head right down to your toes that swept over you like a hurricane and threw you down to the ground, but you bounced right up again and floated right over the tree? Oh, heaven forbid. I never had such a feeling. Oh, Henry, where do you get it from? Not for me. And your father certainly never had any spark. Mother, mother, all I'm trying to say is I met a girl yesterday. Oh, well, I hope she's from a good family. I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. Mother, if one sees a lovely rose... One can be certain that she comes from a fine rose bush. What's her name? Where does she live? I wish I knew. Is she... Is she one of those musical comedy... Oh, no, <laughs> no, no. This time it's entirely different music. It's not the hoochie-coochie. It, it's not the can-can. It's like... Well, it's like a waltz by Strauss. Like a minuet by Mozart. Oh, son, where do you get it from? From you, Mother. Now, you must be just. When I, when I was a little boy, you wanted me to believe in fairy tales. And now when one really happens... Uh, Mother, you remember that story about the young man? I think he was a shepherd who was walking in the woods. Oh, uh, you've been in the country. No. No, it happened right on Broadway. Suddenly, the young man saw a big castle, and out of the window leaned the most beautiful princess. Nothing could stop him. He climbed up the parapet of the castle. Henry, and... have you broken into the Waldorf again? <laughs> Mother, darling, let's forget the fairy tale. I don't think I'll ever find that girl... But if I did, all your troubles would be over. If she didn't want me to gamble, I wouldn't look at another card. I'd stay home every night. Mother, I might even go to work. Henry, that's wonderful. For the first time, you're beginning to sound like your father. Well, anyway, Mother, I don't know where she is, so don't expect too much. And look, uh, Mother, I've been riding around for hours and hours trying to forget this girl. Oh, now, dear, don't you worry. But it was pretty expensive. The cab is still waiting out in front, and the cab driver was so nice to me, I promised him... Oh, I know. Your heart is always bigger than your father's pocketbook. <laughs> well, look under your pillow. I put something there last night. Mother. Mother, sometimes I wonder if you're not spoiling me. <laughs> there was a big crowd at the house that night... All the Van Cleves in New York turned out to meet Albert's fiancée, Martha Strabel. When Albert brought them in, a hundred pair of eyes turned to the door and a hundred tongues stopped wagging. Dear, dear family, 
It is my privilege and honor to present Mr. and Mrs. E.F. Strabel. And last but not least, well, here she is, my fiance, Martha. How do you do, madam? How do you do? Uh, grandfather, Mother Strabel. Welcome, Mrs. Strabel. Did you bring Mabel? Grandfather. We're pretty proud of Mabel, Mr. Van Cleve. Naturally. And you, Mr. Strabel, welcome to our family. Mr. Van Cleve, we people from the West don't talk much, but when we say something, we mean it. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the chance to meet the man who feeds the nation. May you lie as solidly anchored in our hearts as you do in our stomachs. Uh, <laughs> Grandfather, uh, th this is Martha. So, this is Martha. Well, Martha. How do you do, Mr. Van Cleve? Grandpa. Yes, Grandpa. <laughs> if I were about 50 years younger, I'd take you right away from this... Uh, Splendid young man you're going to marry. Kiss your grandpa. Dinner is served. Oh, uh, where's Henry? Oh, here he comes. Uh, Henry, come here. Yes? Martha, dear, I want you to meet Henry Van Cleve, my cousin. How do you... Oh, Miss Strabel. We're celebrating Henry's birthday, Martha, dear. Oh, uh, many happy returns, Mr. Van Cleve. Cousin Henry. Cousin Henry. Thank you, Cousin Martha. Well, Henry, here she is. Now I've done my duty, it'll be your turn next, Henry. That's most unlikely. Oh, nonsense. All you need to do is to find the right girl. It's difficult, Albert. I'm afraid I'll never have your luck. Yes, no question about it. I'm lucky. Oh, where's Father Strabel? Uh, Father Strabel? Uh, Father Strabel? Don't be afraid, Cousin Martha. I... I should have told Albert. It would have been the thing to do. It shall remain our secret. I promise Thank you. Yes, we had a secret. The most innocent secret I ever had. You see, I had met Miss Strabel just the day before. It was in a department store near the telephones. I heard a girl making a call. Hello, Mother. Uh, I'm at the hairdresser's. Oh, they say it will take at least half an hour. Oh, don't worry, Mother. Goodbye. Now, here was a girl lying to her mother. Naturally, that girl interested me at once. Why was this angel lying? I had to find out, so I followed her. But even if she hadn't lied to her mother, I would have followed her anyway. She left the store and went to a bookshop on Fifth Avenue... She seemed very worried about something and kept glancing around nervously looking for a clerk. Well, briefly, I volunteered. May I help you, miss? Thank you. I'd like to... Oh, uh, aren't there any women clerks? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Well, it's... Uh, maybe I'd better come some other time. Oh, uh, please, miss. My employer's watching, and if he sees me losing a customer, it might cost me my job. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, perhaps I can buy some other book. Well, why another book? Please speak freely. Which book do you want? Well, the title of the book is... Yes? Well, it's, uh... Oh, there it is, right there. That one. This one. Oh, yeah. Oh. How to Make Your Husband Happy by Dr. Blossom Franklin. Uh, this one? Yes, that one. Well, I uh, probably should apologize. I imagine I should have called you Madam. No, it's still Miss. But not for long, I presume. That's quite right. Uh, how much is the book? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's very expensive. Oh, that's all right. Uh, now, this is against the interest of the firm, but I must be honest with you. Don't buy this book. You don't need it. I'll tell you something much more appropriate. Leave your nest and fly away with me. Well, I, I might buy that book, too. Well, it's uh, not in stock right now, but I'd love to discuss the idea with you. Please, will you tell me how much is How to Make Your Husband Happy? By Dr. Blossom Franklin. Oh, look, there's her picture. Now, where could a woman like that have found out how to make a husband happy? You certainly don't want to learn anything from her. You're, you're so charming, so young, and so beautiful. You shouldn't say things like that. And if you don't mind, I'd like to buy this book. I do mind. Now, imagine that I'm the man you're going to marry. I couldn't imagine any such thing. What's the matter with me? You think I'm that terrible? Please, I just came in here to buy a book. Now, for the sake of discussion, let's say we are getting married. Now, believe me, I don't want anybody to tell you how to make me happy. The greatest gift you could bring me is to be just as you are, adorable. All I want is a book, just one book. Stubborn, huh? Now, look. If you don't change your attitude, I shall have to complain to your employer. I'm not employed here. 
I'm not a book salesman. Oh. I took one look at you and I followed you into the store. If you'd walked into a restaurant, I would have become a waiter. If you'd walked into a burning building, I would have become a fireman. If you'd walked into an elevator, I would have stopped between two floors and we would have stayed there for the rest of our lives. I... I think you must be mad. Goodbye. Oh, no. Wait. Please. Please. Well, that was our secret. Martha Strabo was the princess I had met. And now she was going to marry Albert. That night, Mrs. Cooper Cooper entertained at the party. I call it entertainment. She was singing. <laughs> Martha, dearest, come outside. Yes, Albert. Martha, dearest. I'm terribly sorry, Albert. Dearest, you don't seem to realize who is singing. I know. Mrs. Cooper Cooper, one of your most important clients. But, Albert, what could I do? I, I had to sneeze. But you did it right in the middle of her aria and five times. But I had to sneeze five times. Dearest, do you think you may have to sneeze again? Well, I, I don't know. I, I can't guarantee it. Well, then, let's not take any chances. Why don't you go into the library and rest a while and see how things develop? Yes, dear. Now, run along now. I'll go back to the drawing room. Oh, I didn't know anybody was here. You didn't know I was here. Is that what you mean? Cousin Martha, look at me. What? You're beautiful. You're so beautiful. Oh, uh, let me go. Let me... Oh, oh, you... You, you kissed me. You're irresistible. Cousin Henry. Yes? You must never do anything like that again. I hardly know you. Why, even Albert, my own fiancé, never dared to... kiss you? Well, of course he kissed me. Why not? But he never kissed me like that. Like what? Oh, I, I hate you. I don't know why I even stay in the same room with you. Please forgive me. But can't we be friends? Never. Now, look. We're going to be related, aren't we? We're going to see each other. How can we help it? Well, I suppose we can't. And if we meet in the future... We don't have to talk about personal things, about you and me. Let's, well, let's talk about something neutral. For instance, Albert. Why not? By the way, do you love Albert? I'm marrying him, am I not? Are you? Yes, I am. No, you're not. You can't. You haven't got that book. What book? How to Make Your Husband Happy. It might interest you to know I went back and bought it. Does it tell you how to make a man happy whom you don't love? Why, he's, he's a fine man. He, he's good. He has integrity. He's full of high ideals. Do you love him? Well... I'm, I'm going to make him a fine wife. At least I'll try my best. And if you ask me any more questions, I'm going to leave this room and I'll never come back here again. Never. <laughs> I still can't understand. An angel like you and Albert. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Why do you want to marry him? Well, I, I've always wanted to live in New York. and Oh, I don't want to say anything against our home. Don't misunderstand me. We have all the modern conveniences and luxuries, but... You don't know father and mother? Well, I've, I've only just met them. Well, don't you think they're sweet? Well, yes, very sweet. Oh, yes, yes, they are. But, you see, it's not very easy living with them. You see, most of the time they don't talk to each other. And whenever a young man and, oh, they wear some very nice ones. Well, I'm sure of it. Well, if I, if one asked for my hand and my mother said yes, my father said no. And if my father said yes, my mother said no. But Albert came when they happened to be on speaking terms and... If I hadn't said yes, who knows when they might have been on talking terms to each other again, and I might have been an old maid. <laughs> no, no. You're not going to be an old maid. You're going to be married, but not to Albert. And yet you won't even have to change the initials on your linens. I don't know what you're talking about. You're going to marry me. We can't. How can I marry you? I'm not even engaged to you. Martha, do you love me? Well, I... I, I hardly know you. Love doesn't need any introductions. You love or you don't love. Do you love me or don't you? Trying to take away the fiancé of your own cousin. Do you love me? Yes. Oh, why did you ever come into my life? To make you happy. To hold you in my arms forever. Oh, I wish I were dead. Look, look let's get away. Let's get married immediately. Tonight, right away. You mean elope? Yeah, that's just what I mean. Well, where would we go? I, I never did such a thing before. 
I, I feel so helpless. Oh, I wish I were dead. Oh, when Romeo and Juliet ran away from home, they didn't stop to say goodbye. When Tristan falls in love with a soldier, they have to sing for three and a half hours. And all I'm asking you to do is to jump into a cab with me and drive to the first justice of the peace. What are we waiting for? Come on. No, wait, listen. Well, now, don't stop now. But Albert... Come on, come on, or do I have to carry you? Listen, we can't. All right, then, I'll carry you. Henry, put me down. Mr. Henry, sir. Open that door, Flood, go quick. Henry! Mr. Henry, sir, what are you doing? Get out of the way. We're going to be married. Mr. Henry! What's the matter? What's all excitement? Right in the middle of Mrs. Cooper Cooper's area. Mr. Albert, they happened, Flogel. Mr. Henry and Mrs. Trable, they're going to be married. Oh! Are you sure? Yes, sir. She was packed by E. of Strable to be served at Albert's table, but that Henry changed the label. Ha, 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 ha. Mr. DeMille presents Act Two of Heaven Can Wait, starring Don Amici and Maureen O'Hara, in just a moment. Meantime, here's a question for Sally. Sally, what do you do when you're writing something with a pencil and make a mistake? Why, you rub it out. You take an eraser and rub it out. Mm Mm-hmm. And what does that do to the paper you're writing on? Well, I don't suppose it helps it any. Matter of fact, sometimes you make a thin place in the paper or even rub a hole right through. Uh Uh-huh. So when you rub a pretty rayon slip with cake soap or rub the fabric together between your fingers... You're certainly not helping the slip any. And you may be doing plenty of damage. That's why it's so much wiser to let gentle Lux suds float away dirt. That's what they do, you know, when you squeeze them through the fabric. Float away the dirt with no rubbing and none of the harmful alkali either that strong soaps have. Lux helps your things last longer, wear better... There's another reason, too, for luxing under things after every wearing. Listen a minute. You're so lovely, darling. You know, I've been looking for you for years. Sentimental? Well, maybe. But what girl doesn't hope for words like that? And Lux girls hear them often. You see, they're always sure of daintiness. And it's so easy to be sure. It only takes a minute to give undies their nightly luxing. So don't take chances. Lux undies after every wearing to guard daintiness and help those pretty things of yours last longer, too. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act two of Heaven Can Wait, starring Donna Michi as Henry and Maureen O'Hara as Martha. Far below in the infernal regions, Henry Van Cleve continues his life history. There's a suspicion of brimstone in the air as the old man talks to his excellency, the devil. And so... We got married. You stole Martha away from Albert, huh? Yes, Your Excellency. Hmm, well, so far I'd say that... Well, let's hear the rest of it. Well, in the next ten years, old houses were torn down and new houses rose taller and taller. But our marriage lasted just like our four-story brownstone house. One morning, a few days before our tenth anniversary, I was coming down the stairs for breakfast... My son, Jackie, was bouncing a ball. Jackie, Jackie, now stop that. Good morning, Daddy. Good morning, Jackie. Now, you know very well you're not supposed to bounce that ball until your mother is up. Oh, I'm sorry, Daddy. I've told you this many times, son. And I'm always sorry. Daddy, I bet you'd like to know what I'm going to give you for your birthday. Yes, I'm dying to know. It's something to wear. Well, now, let me see. Uh, Is it a tie? Oh, I'm not telling. But I'll give you a hint. It has 22 colors in it. Well, no tie has that many colors, so it can't be a tie. It can't be, huh? (laughs) Daddy, how old are you going to be? 36. That's pretty old, isn't it? Well, I never thought about it, but yes, I guess it is. Daddy, when you were as old as me, what kind of a kid were you? Well, I was pretty obedient. When my parents said, go to bed, I never argued about it. I did all my schoolwork. I brushed my teeth every morning, and I never sneaked into the kitchen and stuffed the turkey with my father's old Panama hat. Gee, Daddy, I guess you were a wonderful boy. Well, uh, 
I suppose I was. Then Grandpa must be a terrible liar. <laughs> well, goodbye, Daddy. Goodbye, Jackie. <laughs> Where does he get it from? Good morning, Henry. Morning, Mother. Sit down while your breakfast is still hot. Morning, Grandfather. How are you feeling? <coughs> That's fine. <laughs> Look, Mother, this is a bracelet I bought yesterday. You think Martha will like it? Oh, it's beautiful. Well, after ten years with me, I think she's entitled to it. Yes. Oh, if your father could only be here, Henry, to see you settle down. A fine husband, a good father, and a wonderful son. Well, it's Martha and only Martha. You know, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Oh, by the way, isn't she coming down for breakfast? I didn't go into her room. She's probably tired. Mr. Van Cleve, sir, this telegram came for you. Thank you, Plogdell. What is it, Henry? Anything serious? No, no, nothing. I, uh, I think I'll go upstairs and see if Martha's still asleep. Well, Henry, was Martha still asleep? Show me that telegram, Henry. Here. Yeah. Please don't try to follow me. As soon as I have settled down, I will make plans about Jackie. Don't let him know anything. With your ingenuity, it will be easy to make up a story. Henry, you mean we've lost Martha? It's incredible. It just doesn't make sense, Martha, leaving me. What did you do? What happened? I don't know how I can go on living without her. I love Martha. I love her more than anything on earth. I didn't ask you that. I asked you what happened. I don't know. I always thought she was very happy with me. I don't know what she's heard. You, you know how people would talk about anybody, but... Running away like this, I, I can't see any reason for it. If a woman like Martha runs away from her husband, there must be a reason. Grandfather, what am I going to do? That's up to you. But let me tell you one thing. I am an old man, and I may have to go any day. If you can't make her forgive you, I'll be standing up there right in the entrance. And if you ever try to climb up that ladder, I'll hit you on the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> I figured Martha had gone back to her folks, and I was right. But the thing I didn't know was that she had met Albert on the train. He stopped off with her. Albert, the great corporation lawyer. Albert, the peacemaker. Come in, Martha, dear. Your father and mother will see you now. Hello, father. Hello. Hello, mother. Hello, Martha. Well, I assume there are things between daughter and parents which are better left to, well, <laughs> daughter and parent, if you'll excuse me. Well, I guess it was a pretty muddy ride from the station and all that rain. Yes, I suppose it was. You want some breakfast? Sunday morning we have wheat cakes. Thank you, Father, but I'm not hungry. Well, place hasn't changed much, has it? No, it looks exactly the same. Maybe now you'll appreciate your home. It took you ten years to find out that we were right. If you'd listened to your mother... And your father, things would have been different. Please, father. I don't want to hear a single unpleasant word about the last ten years. Or I'll have to go. Oh, Martha, you look so tired. Come upstairs, child. You're going to have a nice hot bath, and then you're going to lie down and rest. Thank you, mother. Sure, sure. You, you'll be all right here, child. Father... I just talked to Mr. Chuck, sir. He says somebody saw a couple of prowlers somewhere on the grounds. They may be some of them horse thieves. Well, tell Chuck to keep after them. Uh, yes, sir. And if necessary, shoot them. Uh, yes, sir. Excuse me, Father. But if you don't mind, I think I'll go upstairs. I'm pretty tired. Good night. Sure, sure. Good night, Mother. Good night, dear. Breakfast at 7.30. Yes, Mother. Oh, uh, Martha. Yes, Albert? Martha, I want you to have a restful night. And why not? Your troubles are actually over. You paid for your mistakes and paid dearly. Albert, I don't want anybody to get the impression that I'm a victim of ten years of misery. Nothing of the kind. There were moments in my marriage which very few women have been lucky enough to experience. There were times when you were lifted way up to the sky? Yes, way up. Only to be dropped way down afterwards. That's not the purpose of marriage. Marriage is a peaceful, well-balanced adjustment of two right-thinking people. 
I'm afraid that's only too true. Good night, Albert. And, and Martha, there's one other thought I want you to sleep with. My feelings for you have remained unchanged. That's very kind of you. Naturally, I'm not the flashy type like some people, and I would say I'm rather on the conservative side. And if I were, for instance, a suit of clothes, you, well, you'd not call me a stylish cut, and I prefer it that way. But I can safely say that I'm made of solid material. I'm sewed together carefully, and my lining is good. Frankly, I believe I wear well. I'm not too hot in the summer, and I give protection in the winter. Need I say more? No, Albert. You gave a complete and accurate description of yourself. Good night. Thank you, Martha. Miss Martha. Miss Martha, excuse me, please, ma'am, but that horse thief we was looking for... Oh, yes. Did you catch him, Matt Jasper? Yes, ma'am. He's right in your room, waiting for you. In my room, you mean... Oh. Yes, ma'am. That's him. Martha. Henry, you... Oh, Martha, darling, sweetheart. How could you do this to me? Don't you realize what I went through running away like that without a word? Can't you imagine what I suffered? Oh, Martha, Martha. Henry, it won't work anymore. What's Albert doing here? Albert? Yes, Jasper told me. What's he doing here? Well, I just met him by accident on the train. Accident? You expect me to believe that? Here I am looking all, all over the world for my wife, going insane with despair. And where do I find her? 2,000 miles away with another man. I, I just don't see how I can stand anymore. Henry, it won't work. I know your every move. I know your outraged indignation. I know the poor, weeping little boy. I know the strong, silent man. The wounded lion who was too proud to explain what happened in the jungle last night. Oh, so I'm a fake. I'm false. I'm cheap. Henry, please. I know I brought you nothing but unhappiness. You know that's not true. Oh, so we did have some good times together. Some wonderful times. Well, then what do you want? What did I do? Even a murderer has the right to defend himself. You can't hang, hang a, man a man without, without evidence. evidence. I know. If I only knew what particular thing is in your mind. Have you seen that Manetta recently? Of course I have. Oh, well, now everything is clear. Now, let me tell you, when she saw me, yes, I was having tea at the plaza, and at the table with me was a very handsome young woman, but believe me, there was nothing to it. I would have come to you and told you myself, but I... You I just didn't did... want to make me uncomfortable even for one second. That's exactly right, darling. It won't work, Henry. And besides, Aunt Manetta hasn't said one word about you. Oh. All right. All right, I'm fighting a losing battle. I don't love you. I never loved you. I love everybody in New York more than you. There you go again. Listen. It's the 25th of October, Henry. Many happy returns. Thank you, Martha. But it's something much more important than my birthday. It's our anniversary. Ten years ago today, I was almost as much in love with you as I am right now. It's very difficult for a woman to send her husband away on their 10th anniversary... Especially when he speaks as beautifully as you do. But I must do it. All right, darling. I know it's all over. But can't we pretend for just one minute? Here. This is your present. Do you like it? I'd say it cost $10,000. For that money, it's a very good purchase. Well, Martha, what makes you talk like that? If you'd only forgotten to give me this bracelet, I probably would have been foolish enough to be in your arms right now. You've no idea what a mistake you made. The magician played one trick too many. You see, the other day I was having a new photograph made of Jackie and me, and I wanted to have it the right size to fit into your wallet. So I slipped into your room. This is what fell out of your wallet. It's a bill from the jewelers. September the 30th, one bracelet delivered, $500. October the 21st, one bracelet delivered, $10,000. Well, Martha... I don't remember having received any bracelet from you on or about September the 30th. Oh. Oh, so that's what it's all about, huh? <laughs> to think that you had to go through all this only because the jeweler made a mistake. And that's what the whole thing is all about. It's a mistake. I never bought this $500 bracelet. Has the jeweler ever made a mistake on any of our bills before? Oh, so you don't believe me. It's easier for you to believe that I lied than that the jeweler made a mistake. Oh, darling. darling. Henry, this may surprise you, but I just don't believe a word you're saying. I don't believe it either. Grandpa. Martha, darling. Now, come on, let's get started. Let's pack. What do you mean? Well, naturally, you're going back with us to New York. Henry, what are you standing there for? Come on, sweep her off her feet. Otherwise, we'll miss the next train. Where's your bag, Martha? If I can't make her happy, then I don't want her to come back. That's better. No, I, I, I mean it serious. That's why it's good. I'll pack for you, Martha. Martha, let's face it. Do you want a divorce? I see no other way. What about Jackie? Well, naturally, I want him. Yes, I think you're right. The boy should get away from me. Oh, I didn't mean it that way. But I did you want him to turn into another Henry Van Cleve? Where are the rest of your things, Martha? In the closet, but... Fine. For instance, do you know what our little Jackie did the other day? What? 
bought ice cream for a little girl? What's wrong about that? I think it's charming. But the girl he bought the ice cream for was not the girl he should have bought it for. The little devil. And when the one little girl found out that the other little girl... Well, that boy got himself into such a mess. Did he get out of it? Oh, sure. The little girl likes him better than before. Oh, what a child. But let me tell you, he is a problem. I suppose so. But when he comes and makes up his little stories, and you know that they are just little stories, but he wants you to believe them so badly that you wish you could, and finally, well, what else can you do? Yes. Oh, but uh, I'm not talking about... Oh, I... Oh, I don't know. I... Happy anniversary! I'm still too confused. I have to collect myself. You can do it on the train. Well, what am I going to say to my parents? Send them a telegram. You mean sneak out of the house in the middle of the night? Exactly. Like thieves? Yes, like thieves. We did it once before. Why shouldn't we do it again? How many people are lucky enough to have the thrill of eloping twice in one marriage? That's it, that's it. Well, we better get started. Will you come back, Martha? Well... Of course you will. Martha, will you? Yes, Henry, of course I will. We sneaked down the stairs and out into the carriage. Old Strabo saw us, though. He came flying out of the house like a tornado. Come back! Come back here! <laughs> Bye, Father! Come back! And so farewell, dearie of Strabo. We take Martha, you keep Mabel. Yippee! Then one birthday followed another, faster and faster. I became 45, then came 46, 47. And I stopped counting. On one of these birthdays, Martha and I went to the Follies. And at the end of the first act, we saw a very attractive girl coming down a staircase. A few weeks later, I happened to find out that her name was Peggy Nash. And I happened to hear things about her which made me very eager to meet Miss Nash. Well, sit down. How do you do, Mr. Jones? Uh, Jones was the name, wasn't it? Uh, yes, yes, Jones. Uh, how do you do, Miss Nash? Thank you for letting me call. Thank you for those beautiful, beautiful roses. When I saw you the other night at the Follies coming down that stairway, I said to myself... That's the girl of my dreams. <laughs> yes, that's right. You see, Miss Nash... Oh, Jonesy, I... the note that came with your flowers. You liked it? Who wouldn't? That note was so full of charm. It was so sweet. It had all the quaintness of bygone days. Ah, uh, really? Yes. You know, men don't write that way anymore. Oh, why are there so few of you left? Well, to tell you the truth, Miss Nash, I didn't exactly come up here to be admired as a museum piece. Oh, now, Jonesy, don't be touchy. Anyway, Miss Nash... Peggy. Anyway, Peggy, I'm sure it's a waste of time to talk about the past when the present can be so lovely that one anticipates a most delightful future. Oh, Jonesy, it all sounds so wonderful. But, uh, oh, dear. But what? Well, you see this photograph? He's very handsome, isn't he? Oh, friend of yours? Very much so. Serious? I'm afraid it is. Is there anything I could do to make you forget this young man? Mm, Jonesy, you're asking a lot. Would it be indiscreet to ask who he is? Oh, now, come on, Mr. Van Cleve. Don't you know your own son? Miss Nash. Oh, no, I didn't fall into your trap. But it must be rather sad for the great cavalier of the gay 90s to find that his technique's getting rusty. Yes, I've heard all about the daring Henry. I understand in my mother's day you were. And I'm sure you had a very dashing figure. Now you're a kind of retired Casanova. Well, it's always the same with men when they retire. Some grow flowers and some grow a tummy. Miss Nash, my son means very much to me. He means very much to me, too. How much? Shall we say 5,000? Five thousand? Oh, Jonesy, you're underestimating me. I'm much worse than that. But uh, I'll make you a bargain. Twenty-five thousand dollars. I'll send you the money. Before lunch? Before lunch. Goodbye, Miss Nash. You've been perfectly charming. And so have you. And you hope never to see me again? <laughs> no. Goodbye. <laughs> Miss Nash, uh, now that... Our little problem has been solved. I would like to ask just one question, and I'd appreciate an honest answer. I'll give you my word. Suppose you didn't know I was Jack's father, and you happened to see me on the street or in a restaurant. Uh, th this is just an academic question. How old would you say I am? Well, I'd say about 50. That old? Oh, 
I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt you. Oh, no, no, no. That's perfectly all right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, excuse me, but how old are you? Fifty. <laughs> After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille returns with Don Amici and Maureen O'Hara for the third act of Heaven Can Wait. But before we do, Sally has a new version of the old nursery rhyme about the little Indians. It's a very sad story, Mr. Kennedy, so I hope you're in the proper frame of mind. It's about a girl who just bought some new rayon stockings. It goes like this. Four little stockings, pretty as can be, one popped a run. Well, then there were three. Three little stockings, pretty nearly new, got rubbed with cake soap. Oops, only two. Two little stockings, my story's nearly done. Strong soap weakened them, so now there's one. And you know a girl can't go around wearing just one stocking. A very sad story, Sally. But I'm afraid your heroine wasn't awfully bright. She was just plain dumb, Mr. Kennedy. Why, if she'd luxed those stockings, she might still be wearing them. She might indeed. We have proof, you know that Luxing Stockings cuts down runs over 50%. In a whole series of tests on rayon stockings, the ones washed with Lux Flakes lasted far longer than those rubbed with cake soap or washed with a strong soap. Luxing cut runs in half. And that goes for silk and nylon and cotton, too, as well as rayon. Whatever kind of stockings you're wearing, a Luxing a day helps to keep runs away. Just be sure you let your rayons dry thoroughly. They need from 24 to 48 hours to get dry all the way through. And be sure you get Lux Flakes. If your dealer is out of Lux when you ask for it, he'll have more soon. So ask him again in a day or two. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. After the play, we have an appointment with two very charming people, our stars. But now the curtain rises on the third act of Heaven Can Wait, starring Donna Michi and Maureen O'Hara. The recital and the, of the life and sins of Henry Van Cleve is drawing to a close. As Henry talks, His Excellency the Devil listens attentively, jotting down notes on a pad of red paper. At the age of 50, then, you found you were growing a bit corpulent, unattractive to the ladies. Yes. You were displeased? Well, in a way, a man likes to feel that, well... Vanity. I suppose that's it. Continue, please. Well, another year rolled by, and Martha and I celebrated our 25th anniversary. Early in the evening, she disappeared. I found her later, sitting alone in the library. Well, darling, what are you doing here all alone? Nothing. I just wanted to take a little rest. After all, it's been such an exciting evening. Nothing wrong, is it? Oh, no, nothing, dear. I'm just... Just what? Well, to tell the truth, I'm being a little sentimental... So I came in here for a few minutes. Ah, yes. This is where it all started. Twenty-five years ago. Yes. Uh, I was standing there by the window. No, you were sitting in the chair. Oh, that's right. And then, and then you came in. You went over to the window. Then suddenly you started walking towards me. Very slowly. I could count every step. Oh, you were such a frightened little girl. Darling, <laughs> I want to make a confession. After all, we have been married 25 years. Well, what is it, Martha? I wasn't frightened at all. You weren't? When you were walking towards me so slowly, do you know what was in my mind? I thought, what's the matter with him? Can't he walk any faster? (laughs) You darling Martha. Yes, Robert? Mrs. Van Cleve, you're wanted on the telephone. Oh, thank you. Hello. Yes, I called you. Well, it's really not important. Yes, everything's all right now. I'll call you tomorrow. Who was that? Oh, nothing special. Let's go back to our guest, shall we? Darling, who was that on the phone? Oh, I'll tell you all about it some other time. Why not now? All right, I'll tell you. This is another confession. My lover. I don't think that's funny at all. Are you jealous? Oh, don't don't be silly, Martha. But why can't you tell your husband whom you talked to over the telephone? And besides, I wouldn't have brought it up right now, but for the last several weeks you've been going out in the afternoons and you've always managed to avoid telling me where you were. You are jealous. Oh, Henry, (laughs) at last, after 25 years. Thank you, darling. Martha, whom did you talk to? Well, do you promise to be sensible and not to make a mountain out of a molehill? Yes, I promise. 
Well, you know how women are. We have too much time on our hands, and we begin to imagine things are wrong with us. Well, I'm no exception. So I've been going to a doctor, that's all. <laughs> Darling, you know, I certainly feel like a fool. <laughs> now, I'll make a confession. I really was jealous. Imagine a man of my age get... Martha, what did you see the doctor for? What, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, really. So that's why you came in here. You weren't feeling what... Darling, is it serious? I tell you, it's nothing at all. Just a little dizzy spell. Now, you promised to be sensible. What did the doctor say? Listen, dear... If I take five drops three times a day, and if you don't worry too much about me, we'll both live to celebrate our golden anniversary. Now, let's dance. I didn't know it then, but this was our last anniversary. It was the last time we danced together. There were only a few more months left for Martha, and she made them the happiest of all our lives. I was a lonely man after Martha died. I kept searching for something in life and never finding it. Perhaps it was my youth I was looking for. Perhaps it was Martha. One morning, I came home at breakfast time. I had been out all night. My son, Jack, caught me sneaking into the house. Father, is that you? Oh, good morning, Jack. I'd like to talk to you, Father. Now, Jack... I said I... I'd like to talk to you. Come into the library. Jack, I, I heard a very funny joke. It'll start your day off with you a laugh. You should be ashamed coming home at all hours, making a wreck of yourself. How long do you think you can keep this up? Please, now, Jack, don't scold me. Someday you're going to collapse. I know you're right, Jack. I shouldn't be living this kind of life. But, my boy, put yourself in my place... I'm lonesome. You're always away somewhere on business, and being alone in this big house night after night, you don't know what it's like. Neither do you, because you're never at home. Yeah, but, but I can imagine what it's like, and Jack, it's horrible. I want to have a talk with you. I'm not fooling myself. I, I'm not getting any younger. And I think the time has come to change my way of living. Oh, yes? All right, who is she? Who? The girl you want to marry. Who said anything about getting married? No, no, no. What I had in mind was something entirely different. You know, Jack, the other day when I was all alone in the house, you know what I felt like doing? What? Jack, I felt I'd like to sit down in a comfortable chair and read and read and read. Why didn't you? Jack, my eyes can't take it anymore. Why don't you go to an oculist? Uh, that might do, yes, on the other hand, what do you think of the idea of, well, of some kind of a reader, you know, someone with a pleasant voice and nice diction? Come on, out with it. Who is she? Well, you have the most suspicious mind. How old is she? Well, she is an unusually adult young woman. I met her at old Wilson Weatherby's house. She was his reader. Father, this is the silliest idea I ever heard. Now, Jack, why do you want to deprive your old father of a little cultural pleasure? Look at all these beautiful books. I can think of nothing more dignified and homelike than sitting in front of a fireplace and having someone read one of them to me. Something worthwhile. Something like, well, like this, perhaps. Now, let's see. This book... Well, something like what? What book is it? How to Make Your Husband Happy. Where did that thing come from? That's been here a long time. I, I'd forgotten it. Forgotten what? Uh, Father, about this reader you want, this girl. I've forgotten that, too. I don't want her, Jack. I, I guess I don't want much of anything. As a man grows older, his medicine cabinet grows bigger. At the age of 70... My medicine bottles filled six shelves. The night I died, I'd eaten everything the doctor said I shouldn't. When I woke up, there was a nurse sitting beside me. A nurse, she was a vision. I opened my eyes, and there she was. Nellie Brown, registered nurse. Your Excellency, one look at her, and it didn't matter whether she was registered or not. Hmm. 
And then, then Nellie took out a thermometer, and she said, open your mouth. Well, who wouldn't for Nellie? Then she put the thermometer in my mouth, and my temperature went up to 110. Who could ask for a more beautiful death? Well, Your Excellency, that's the story of my life. And now I'd be grateful if you'd ring for the elevator and send me down where I belong. No, definitely no. Sorry, Mr. Van Cleve, but we don't cater to your class of people. Please make your reservation somewhere else. Somewhere else? But, Your Excellency, if I walk into the lobby of the other place... You mean above? Yes, I know what will happen. The man behind the desk will say, can't you read the sign? Clientele restricted. Well, you never can tell. Sometimes they have a small room vacant in the annex. Not exactly on the sunny side, not so very comfortable. The bed may be hard, and you might have to wait a few hundred years till they move you into the main building. Oh, I don't think they'll even let me register. Well, it doesn't hurt to try. After all, they may inquire about you among the residents in the main building, and I think you'll find a lot of people who'll give you a good reference. That always helps. For instance, Grandfather. Oh, yes, yes, Grandfather. Don't you think he'll be waiting for you? He might. He will, and not with a baseball bat. And there must be many old waiters from Sherry's and Delmonico's whom you tipped generously. And those old cab drivers who still remember that you never waited for the change. Yes, I wouldn't be surprised if you have a lot of friends up there. And if they all should fail, there's someone else. Yes, she is up there. She will plead for you. Do you think so? You know she will. Mr. Van Cleve, I would say you have a chance. Anyway, it's worth trying. Here's the elevator. Goodbye, Your Excellency, and thank you. Good luck. Oh, I'll need it. Going down, sir? No, up. Stars will be back in a moment. You know, people have different ideas about almost everything, even washing dishes. I do my dishes once a day. Just rinse and stack them, tuck them away in the laundry tub, and then wash up the whole lot at a time. I think it's more efficient. I wouldn't think of letting dirty dishes stand around. I get them out of the way just as fast as I can after every meal. Different methods, but listen to this. I use Lux Flakes, of course. I wouldn't think of using anything else but Lux. Yes, it's Lux for dishes, whichever plan you follow. First, Lux saves your hands. If you've let strong soaps give your hands that dishpan look, change to Lux. Soon your hands will be soft and smooth again. That's been proved in many, many tests. Second, Lux does more work, does up to twice as many dishes as the same weight of well-known dishwashing soaps tested. You get so many suds with Lux Flakes, they're very thrifty. Use Lux thriftily, too. Don't waste it. Use all you need to get good suds, but no more than you need. Try Lux tomorrow for dishes and see for yourself how much work it does, how kind it is to hands. Be sure you get Lux Flakes. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. In the book that lists fine performances given at this microphone, you'll find written in large letters the names of Don Amici and Maureen O'Hara. And here they are for a curtain call. Thank you, C.B., I, uh, I have a rather important piece of news for the audience. Well, let's have it, Don. Well, in all fairness to you, Maureen, I think they should know that you're not 60 years old, as you were at one time during the play, but just 23. 